And good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you'd like to, go ahead and open your Bibles to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. That's where we'll begin reading this morning. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 3. A lot of what I'm going to say this morning is uh, probably repetition for some of you. Uh, for some of you, it's going to be a really good refresher of things that we've already learned before, but probably need to hear again. And for some of you, especially if you're visiting with us, might be the first time we, you hear about something. Um, but as you, everybody knows by now, right? Everybody knows by now, unless you live under a rock, uh, the current times that we're living in and, and things that are going on in the country. Um, and so things like sports events have completely changed. Things like schools, their curriculum and their school year has completely been altered because of the coronavirus and, and precautions being taken for that. And if uh, you're worshiping here with us, this worship assembly has been altered too. Lots of churches have been changing the way they do things in, in, uh, in attempts to, to be safer around uh, this time of year and so that way the virus and other sicknesses like that don't spread. Um, I think probably for me, this, times like these have probably been unprecedented. I don't think ever before I have seen that toilet paper has been the hottest commodity. <laughs> I saw something on Facebook saying that, you know, Tumor's Corner pictures of it look like a gold mine right now. Um, I don't think I would have seen times where uh, people would go to Walmart in, in droves and flocks and, and, and pile up things that weren't, you know, bread and milk. And things like that where people are genuinely frightened or maybe just apprehensive about what things are going to come. And so people are preparing for maybe the worst. I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen, like I've already mentioned, so many events being shut down or postponed or things like that. People are genuinely wondering what's coming next. And I think right now is probably the best time for you as a Christian to step up and voice what the Word of God says. Amen. What we need to understand this morning, brethren, is first off, God is in control. Amen. If you go with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, read with me what it says right there. Read in verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense for anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. I know exactly this is not exactly talking about what we are exactly going through. It's talking about suffering, the thing that you believe in, the thing you hope in. But this is the idea. Let me present to you an idea this morning and we're going to run with it throughout the duration of the sermon. The idea here is that a lot of the world around us is confused. They're conflicted. A lot of people are genuinely worried. Uh, whether they have a right to or whether it's that bad, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to be a health professional this morning and tell you what you do need to do and what you don't need to do to avoid this virus, okay? That's not my job. My job this morning is to present the God's word that he is in control and that some people are going to look at us as Christians. You know one thing that we're doing differently, as I've already mentioned, that a lot of the world isn't doing right now? For one, we're coming to church on Sunday morning. How many congregations around us, and I'm not judging, I, every congregation is autonomous, they have their own difficulties, their own challenges, but how many congregations or even churches around us have closed down and they're not meeting this morning? Just by what we're doing this morning, it's different. The world isn't doing it. A lot of people on Facebook are going to look at you, your friends or your family, they're going to say, why are you doing things as you normally would be when the world around you is just doing everything differently? Why are we doing things differently? What, they ask you, what is it that you hope in? How come you're so calm and collected when things are going around you like they are right now? How, how is it that you seem to have some hope when everything else seems to be in a little bit of despair? All right? I don't mean to paint just a, a black, dark picture this morning about how the world is. People are making fun of it. People are taking light of it. Some people are being really serious with it. And you may, I, I don't, wherever you are, it's fine. Just know that God is in control this morning, and I want to talk to you about it. But what the hope is this morning, brethren, is that you know that. And when there are people who are honestly searching and seeking for an answer, because they're afraid, because they're scared of what the future holds, you can provide some relief. So go with me to Acts chapter 4 as we begin this morning. Acts chapter 4. I want to read a, a passage here in Peter's prayer. <clears throat> Acts chapter 4. In 
In Acts chapter 4, read there with me uh, at the start of Peter's prayer, starting in verse 23. To give some context of what's going on, uh, Peter and John have just been scolded for preaching the Word of God. All right, they're preaching the Word of God. They've been scolded for it. They're a little bit punished for it. And so they're let go by the authorities, and they meet up with other Christians, and they begin to pray this prayer to God. Read there with me what it says, verse 23. And being let go, they went their own companions, and they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to the God in one accord, and they said, Lord, you are God. You made the earth, the heavens, and the sea, and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage? Why did they plot vain things? The kings of earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Verse 27, read there with me. For truly against your servant, your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. Let me, let me tell you what Peter's saying here. He's praying to God. He says, God, I know you're almighty. You're the one who created everything, the earth, the heavens. We believe that. See the parallel here for just a second, please. Peter mentions in verse 27, when they crucified the Christ, you know who crucified the Christ? The authorities, the Gentiles, God's own people, the Israelites, they crucified Christ. And when they did that, if you go back to the gospel story, they knew what they were doing. They knew they were killing someone. They thought that they were putting an end to Jesus, to his ministry. They thought he was going to be like everybody else who came before him and said they were someone special. They knew in their own minds that what they were doing is putting an end. They they were controlling the world in their heads. There are a lot of people right now who think that their things are just out of control, that other people are controlling things. They don't know what to do. They're scared. They're anxious of what's to come. Read verse 28 there with me. And it says, verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. The, the, the Gentiles, the Romans, the Israelites, they all thought they were, they were putting Christ to death. But God, and you hear Peter in his prayer says, God, you had determined this beforehand. I want you to see the parable. He's saying, you're in control. They thought they were putting the Christ to death, but this was already planned. Jesus said, I'm giving my own life willingly. And God is the one who planned it from the very beginning. I'm not saying that God is planning the current events right now. He's letting things unfold. That's how God works. Time and chance happens to us all. But ultimately, the one who is overseeing it is God, and I wholeheartedly believe that. And in all of that, brethren, I hope you do too. Somebody asks you, how are you calm collected? How are you not anxious? And maybe you are a little anxious, but you know God is in control, and so that gives you peace. Go with me to Philippians chapter 4, please. Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, read there with me what it says right there in verse 6 and 7. Paul here speaks, and if you don't know where Paul's at, he's probably in prison. So I don't know how many of you being in prison could have spoken like this, but this is what Paul says, verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your prayers be known to God, be made known to God, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This guy's in prison. He's saying, you pray to God, you let your anxieties, you put them on Him, and you're going to get a peace that passes this world's understandings. I don't know about you, but there's not a whole lot of peace being put in the media right now. I mean, a, a gentleness of mind, a tranquility when you go to bed at night. There's not a lot of that. With everything going on from the coronavirus to the 2020 elections, a lot of people feel like their life is a riot right now. It's just going one up, one down, and it's continuing like that. As a Christian, because you know God is in control, you know that ultimately He's got everything in His hands. So that gives you peace. So that way when you have worries of whether or not I'm going to be sick, whether or not my parents are going to be sick, through whatever temptation or trial, God is the one ultimately in control, and that gives you peace. 
that passes this world's understanding. Because if you think about it, people are freaking out right now. We already mentioned it, and you, know, you make light of it, but you buy toilet paper, you buy it in bulk, the way that the stores are running out like that. The reason that is because people don't have peace. They don't know. I mean, I know that sounds like a joke, but it's real. People do not have peace that something better is going to come out. So they freak out. So they buy toilet paper. And so that leaves less for the people who actually need it. And they buy sanitary you know, items where other people really could use it. And so that means people go without. And people have less now because people have been scared. And all that is a result of people not having a peace that passes this world's understanding. You as a Christian, you have a prime opportunity to show somebody what God has given you in your life. Amen. Knowing that He is in control, you can offer that peace. That doesn't mean in any way that you're going to live a perfect life and that nothing is going to happen to you. If you go to look at Paul's life, Paul said multiple times, he, he, he went without. If you look at Philippians, if you go back to chapter 2, it reads in verse 11, now that I speak in, uh, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned that whatever state I am in, to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound Everywhere in all things I have learned both full to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. This individual, Paul said, I mean, I've, I've learned to be everything. I'm not going to have a lot sometimes. I'm going to have a lot sometimes. And sometimes when I do it, that's fine. There's God on my side. He's in control. If you go with me to Matthew chapter 6, please. Go with me there. Matthew chapter 6. I want you to see what Jesus had to say about this. Matthew chapter 6. Read there with me, verse 25 onward. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is it not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for neither they sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not any more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even as Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, he will, uh, will He not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that the needs of all things, but, they, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, and sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You're taught by Jesus, and a man who didn't have anything. No, I think the way Ben Hall put it when he was here was great, where he told people, to just, just follow me. And he didn't tell me anything else. And people might have those, that mindset, Jesus, where are you going? Where are you sleeping? Where are you eating? And Jesus just, he didn't have a clue sometimes. He didn't know what he was going to eat. He didn't know where he was going to stay. It's not that he was ignorant. That wasn't that he was just so poor. He was confident God would protect him. And so Paul, along with this verse right here, what we just read, uh, Christian, you have full confidence that God is going to protect you. doesn't mean you won't suffer physically. You might. A lot of you know. A lot of you know very well what it means to suffer physically. But you've gone through that. And you've come out of that. And it's always been Christ and God who have been holding you through every step of the way. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, please. 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. A lot of the suffering that we suffer as Christians is not just physical, but spiritual. And we're, we're always told, if you, if you desire to live a godly life, you will suffer persecution. The Bible tells us that. Read there with me in 1 Peter chapter 4, reading in verse 12. 
Beloved, do not think it is strange concerning the fiery trial which is, tri- which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the Spirit of the glory of God rests upon you, on the part where He is blasphemed, but on your part He is glorified. But let none, of your su- uh, let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. A lot of people are suffering, whether it's physical or, or spiritual right now. My point in all of this, Christians are going to go through it. It's promised to you in the Bible. But the opportunity that you have right now is to change somebody Say, I've been through it. I've been through the mire. I've been through that af- that, that, those afflictions. And I'd love to help you. As a Christian, if you suffer for being a Christian, God tells you very plainly, you should be rewarded for that. And you will be rewarded for that in due time. Someone's going to ask you, why, are you so cra- why aren't you afraid? Why aren't you anxious about this or that? About the current times. And they're going to ask you a reasoning behind that. What kind of answer are you going to give? What I want to make with this point, go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 34. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, we won't read everything, but let me give you a little context of what's going on. Moses here is, is, is already older. He's 120 years of age. He's, a, he's an older guy. And if you remember anything about the story of the Israelites, them coming out of Egypt, Moses was with them the entire time. Think about Moses in the Old Testament. He was their leader. He prayed for them. He prayed over them. He put himself to death. Uh, not literally, but he put himself where they needed to be punished. He interceded for them. There are times where he was leading the Israelites where their complaining was so much that he just got so tired of them that he said, God, would you just kill me now? It's too much. Moses knew what it was to suffer. And at the, all the work that he ever did, all the good things that he did, is what we would consider good, he kind of messed it up towards the end. The people were thirsty and they wanted water. So Moses went to a rock and God said, tell them that I will give them water out of this rock. Instead, he hid it. And he said, look at the water that me and my brother are giving you. And after all the work for 40 years that he performed, he messed it up at the very end. So he was not allowed to enter into that promised land. Can you imagine working for something for 40 years, pretty much giving your life to it, and not getting that reward that you wanted so badly? But he performed his duty, and God was with him the entire time. I want you to see what he says about God. He writes a song when he comes close to his death. He's a wise old man, and this is what he has to say, verses 1 through 4. Those are numbers, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 32, excuse me. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 4. Moses' song. He says, pay attention, verse 1. Give, O ear, O heavens. I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain. Let my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops as the tender herb, and it showers on the grass. Verse 3, For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock, His work is perfect, for all His ways are justice, and God of the truth, without injustice, righteous and upright is He. If I were to tell you right now that the promises God says, I'll take care of you both physically, spiritually, as crazy as this world is getting this, And I were to tell you, God is faithful to His words, and He's been faithful to me all my life. It probably doesn't make as big as an impact coming from a 24-year-old. But coming from a 120-year-old at the end of his life, 
where he had worked for God, been a servant for him, and then not been allowed to enter into the promised land because of something he did at the end of his life, writes something like this, as you read again, verse 4, is a God of truth, or maybe your translation might say a God of faithfulness, and without injustice, and righteous and upright is He. If you don't take it from me, take it from Moses, of what kind of God we serve, who is faithful to His Word. There are a lot of people right now, I'm sure, uh, that are keeping up with the news, and if you keep up with the news, uh, I'll give a very short paraphrase of just something that I've learned. You know, the, the coronavirus as a whole may not be super deadly, uh, but there's no cure for it, so it affects especially uh, you know, the elderly and the young or those who have immune deficiency, things like that. There are a lot of older Christians right now who are showing a lot of faith in God, who are saying to themselves, not, not just in this congregation, I don't mean to praise anyone, but like Moses say, I serve a faithful God. It does not matter if the government or authorities suggest for us to not congregate, to not go out. There are a lot of people throughout their lives and through trials they've gone through say, you know what, I serve a faithful God too. And so this morning, I encourage you to think about how God has been faithful to you. And as we leave the assembly, you teach someone else who desperately needs that. And so God has been great to you. He's all-powerful. That gives you peace that He's in control. He tells you He will protect you. Doesn't mean hard times won't come, but His protection is over all of us. And so finally, if you go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to reuse a point that Ben Hall used while he was here. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Read there with me, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation. For what reason? Why has God been so good to me? Why does He comfort me? What is the end result of that? Verse 4. So that we may also be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. Ben Hall pointed out this to us, and I think it's great that we implement it right now, right here again. God has comforted you. If you're a Christian, you've been washed in the blood. God has watched over you. He has forgiven you of your sins. He's given you a peace that passes this world's understandings. It is now on you to pass that on to someone else. Go with me to Matthew chapter 10. I want you to see something there. Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, as is, is Jesus is sending out the twelve, I, I want you to pay attention to something He says to them when He talks about comforting some people, comforting people who are physically ill, who have really big problems in their lives. I want you to see what He says as He says, verse 6. He says, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go to the Jews. There's a lot of people of the Jews who are really suffering. And me as Christ, I'm sending you the apostles so that way you can comfort some people. Verse 7, And as you go, preach saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Pay attention to verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead and cast out demons. Freely as you have received, freely give. A lot of the power that was going to be given to these apostles came through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ giving it to them. We're comforted by the Spirit. Freely as you have received, brethren, freely give. It's the same principle. Spiritual powers through comfort that God gives us. I don't know how much you think that you've received in your life that comfort, but it's time to give back. As we come to a close of the lesson this morning, if you'd let me, I'd like to read from you a poem about this idea of giving Uh, There's an author, uh, his name's Arthur Gordon. Uh, I believe he lived in the 1900s, wrote for Reader's Digest and whatnot. Uh, Pay attention to what he says about the influence that you can have in a very dark world. He He writes this, it's called A Touch of Wonder. 
There is not enough darkness in all the world to put the light of one to put out the light of one candle. This inscription was found on a small new gravestone after a devastating air raid on the Britain in World War II. Some thought it must be a famous quotation, but it wasn't. The words were written by a lonely woman whose pet had been killed by a Nazi bomb. This is what the author has to say about that inscription. I have, also, I have always remembered these words, not so much for their poetry and imagery, but for the truth that they contain. In moments of discouragement, defeat, or even despair, there are always certain things to cling to, little things usually, remembered by laughter, the face of a sleeping child, a tree in the wind, in fact, any reminder of something deeply felt or dearly loved. No man is so pure so poor as to not have many of these small candles. When they are light, darkness goes away, and a touch of wonder remains. If you didn't understand what he was saying, basically each one of us, and this is based off Scripture, by the way, we're the light to the world. And none of us are so small that we can't have an impact on somebody else. He said he saw it on a tombstone, and it really stuck with him. That someone in their dying breath thought, you know what, uh, even my light can't be dampened out. You have an opportunity, Christian, this morning to help somebody and reaffirm your faith in God who is the controller of this world. Lastly, if you please go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Read there with me, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what He has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. A lot of people are scared, and they're scared of something that can destroy the physical body. You know very well what the Bible says. Do not fear those or fear something that can destroy the physical body, but the spiritual man. And so Paul writes to the Corinthians, we're not scared of persecution, but we do have terror of the Lord. We know that one day we will be called to judgment. You have an opportunity to reaffirm in yourself, reaffirm in someone else, that the coronavirus or something like that, the stock market going down, 2020, none of that is as scary as being before God. Amen. None of that is as scary as being before God. I know the terror of the Lord, so therefore, verse 11 says, we persuade men to change their ways so that they're ready to meet their Maker. This morning, I hope that through the Gospel, through the Word of God, you're more affirmed in who God is. You have peace in that, but that you're willing to share it with somebody else. But this morning, if you've realized that you haven't been right with God and you need to make some changes, why don't you let us know what you want to do?